parents and have their uh, focuses. And I'm not gonna get into two of them, but I wanna focus on more of the Pauline uh, apostolic ministry. But first, what we wanna do is understand that there will never be any more big A apostles. That's right. Can we agree to that? Amen. Meaning there are apostles of the Lamb mentioned in the book of Revelation, and they are the only uh, the only ones of that type. Yes. And so they are the ones who stand in the office when Peter brought up in Acts chapter 1, as it's recorded, that they had to replace Judas, who left his office. Um, they replaced him with Matthias as a way of uh, replacing the 11, uh, I'm sorry, that one person that, so that they'd have the 12 foundational apostles. And uh, they said that they wanted to have somebody stand in that office. And so there are 12 standing in that office. And then many could argue that Paul belongs in that group. I would be one of those. Some would say he belonged in uh, that group in as the one to replace Judas. I'm not gonna get into that, but he definitely stands in that place as an ap apostolic leader who was one of the foundational apostles as he also saw Jesus as it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 9. So everything that the other apostles had, he qualified with the same criteria. And so we have foundational apostles, and Ephesians 2, it's recorded, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. And so we see that there were apostles and prophets that were the foundation and uh, in my estimation what that was referring to was that there were the prophetic writings of the old testament that was the foundation of the gospel and then you have the new testament writings which came from the apostles so that's why the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets you could also argue that in a functional sense that continues on as well, that there are apostles and prophets who are the foundation, but none like the original foundation. After the first century, there are only functional apostles or apostolic leaders. They are not foundational, they are functional. That's right. Um, I don't believe there is an office of apostle. I believe it's more of a description than an office. That's my personal conviction. And so we see functional apostles built upon the foundation of the big A, Apostles of Christ. And we see that alliterated in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. It says that he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up the body of Christ. And so we see there that after the foundation of the apostles have been laid, you have functional apostles that came after these big A apostles. And we know that these functional apostles still exist today because it says quite clearly in the rest of Ephesians 4 that these apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists are going to be in function until some would say until. until. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. I don't think anybody believes we've arrived at that point yet. No, we have not. We're not in the unity of the faith and the mature manhood of the corporate son. We haven't arrived there. Or have we, nor have we arrived to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so we see the need for the further function of not only the apostle, but the function of all the other four. Uh, my friend Alan Hirsch calls it a past apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. So some call it fivefold ministry, some call it the ascension gift ministry, whatever you want to call it. But it is a functional ministry 
that is still in effect because we still need to mature into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Amen. And so it's very easy for us to mimic the works of an apostle in some ways, but it's not always easy to mimic all of the criteria of the apostolic, as we're going to look at right now. So what I want to talk about is some of the characteristics of New Testament apostles, because it was not just descriptive, it was prescriptive. It was something that I believe is an example for all time. As far as the history of the church goes, the book of Acts and the epistles were always written so that we can mimic it, so we could replicate it in our own churches, in our own lives. So that's my personal conviction. And so in terms of some of the characteristics of apostles, uh, or you might say apostolic leaders, um, in no particular order, I wrote these down. They have Christ revealed in them to reveal Christ through them. Amen. Let me say that again. They have Christ revealed in them to reveal Christ through them. We see Paul write, as it's recorded in the first in, in the letter of uh, Galatians, the book of Galatians. He said, "When he who had set me apart before I was born." and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me or in me in order that I may preach him among the Gentiles. So there was a personal encounter with the living God, with Jesus Christ. And so anybody who's going to have a functional apostolic grace upon them have, has had to have an intimate encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's very, very powerful as we look at that first chapter of Galatians. Uh, Paul made it very clear. Uh, he was seen to be quoting from Jeremiah chapter 1 where God said, Before you were born, I set you apart as a prophet. And so he seemed to echo those words that God set him apart before he was born and called him by his grace to reveal his son in him. And so by implication... There is a Christ-likeness. It's not just the works of Christ, it's the character of Christ. Amen. And if you try to have the works of Christ without the character of Christ uh, formed and shaped inside of your life, then eventually you're going to have a huge scandal because your works will only be sustained by the breadth and depth of your character. Amen. And so that's the first thing I want to mention is Christ in us shaping us, forming us. As Paul said in Galatians 4, I think it's verse 13, that he prayed and travailed until Christ was formed in them. And that to me is the name of the game of Christianity and being like Christ. There are many people who can prophesy and cast out demons. Jesus would say, I never knew you. But the main thing is being like Christ from the inside out. Second thing I want to mention as a characteristic of an apostle is they father spiritual sons and daughters. They don't just produce church members. Whereas teachers can produce disciples, it's not as easy to produce sons and daughters. And so somebody functioning with the grace of apostle is first and foremost a spiritual parent. In this case, a spiritual father who develops a loyalty, develops a kinship, who pours his life into people in such a way that they have that organic relational uh, component together where they are son and father, father, daughter. They have that kind of relationship that Paul talked about when he referred to Titus and he said about Timothy, my own son in the faith. He called those that he was mentoring sons <laughs> And he didn't just call them, uh, well, he never called anybody a church member, but he had that kind of relationship with them. So another important component on an apostolic person is they have grace to produce uh, spiritual sons and daughters. Here's another one. They are builders, not just blessers. Builders, not just blessers. Many ministers are called to be great blessers. You have them come in for three days, they prophesy over everybody, over everybody, or they 
give great messages and teaching. They get everybody excited. They're in and they're out and they're gone. They did what they were called to do. They edified the church. They excited everyone. Maybe they brought correction. Maybe they built faith. Maybe they raised money. Maybe they broke, broke through certain areas uh, that the church needed. But they're not building. They're blessing. There's a lot of thought leaders that are like that. There are a lot of teachers and prophets that are like that. Uh, evangelists that are like that. They go from city to city. They help do crusades. They're blessings. Uh, it's easy to gather a crowd, but once you have the crowd, what are you going to do with them? Very easy. I tell that to new, new pastors. You know, you, you start off with a lot of people. One of my friends, he started off, almost had a 1,000 people after six months. Of course, 98% of them came from other churches, but that's another conversation. <laughs> Kingdom wasn't expanded, they were just swapping fish. But, um, you know, within a few years, that, that went down to two or 300. I don't even know if it's that much now. So it's one thing to gather a crowd. Any evangelist has a gift of garnering people, gathering people, bringing in crowds. But what do you do with them once they come in? The test is after the first two or three years of having a large crowd, now you're going to deal with how do I disciple them? Uh, how do we get them in systems? How do we harness the move of the spirit in the church to produce a great missionary movement, uh, church planning movement? Uh, how do we uh, use what we have to serve our city? How do we send people out, not just bring them in? And... Apostles are builders, they're not just blessers. They could come into a place and bless, but their primary motivation is to build. It's like me, I don't like just going and speaking in conferences or going to nations, I've turned down so many invitations. I don't usually go somewhere unless I sense I am called to build with whoever is inviting me, or it's connected to a movement of a friend of mine or some kind of movement, I'm also helping with ICAL, that's a huge global thing, so I'm helping Apostle Kelly with that. So if I'm helping Kelly, if I go there as an ambassador, that's different, but it's still building part of a large movement. I don't like just going somewhere and there's no connection after that. That's not who I am. Paul said about himself in 1 Corinthians 3, starting with verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, that's a, the Greek word where you get the word architect from. I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So they are builders, not just blessers. They have convening influence to gather other leaders. We see that in Acts chapter 15, where James called a collection of all the apostles and leaders and elders together to make a determination regarding that which Paul was preaching. They have the humility and character of Christ worked in them. In Ephesians 4 verse 1, it talks about being humble and gentle and long-suffering. Before he describes the fivefold gifts, he gets into the character, the grit, meaning if you're going to walk in the function, you have to first have the imprint of Christ, the character of Christ, to qualify you. Amen. Whenever you put somebody in a leadership position because they're gifted, you're looking for trouble. Amen. If they don't stand the test of time in terms of character. They have the grace to endure much suffering. And the short time I know uh, Apostle Najim, I, have, I know his story and I see some of the things he goes through. And some of the things that he goes through would destroy an average pastor. And yet, he continues on with the grace of God. That's a mark of an apostle. Just a few more. They have great faith to break open the heavens over a community. They make an impact in a community. Certainly, this community knows about this church, this man, this ministry. They are bridge builders. They bring people of different ethnicities together, different denominations. Uh, they build out of life experience, not just Bible knowledge. Some of the greatest apostolic leaders I know have very little theological training. I'm not saying you don't need some theological training, but they have such extraordinary life experience. They're able to bring that experience to bear in a way that they're able to build strong leaders and movements and people. And last but not least, uh, two more, they love the church. 
You don't love people. You don't belong in any kind of ministry, never mind apostolic ministry, because we're first and foremost shepherds of the flock. Some apostolic leaders might say, well, I'm, you know, I'm more of a, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm just looking at the big picture. But you better love people. If you don't love people, you're not qualified. Amen. And they have insight that is relevant for contemporary ministry or con in the culture and context that they're in. And the last thing I'll read, Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he had revelation that was commensurate to the age, to the generation that he lived in. Obviously, we'll never build anything different from that or equal to that because that's scripture we'll never have that but the point is is apostolic leaders need to have the insight from god that's applicable and that is needed based on the times community culture and context in which they live and the apostle definitely has been able to do that has been able to adopt the ministry uh in the last 30 years to the different needs whether it's starting a school whether it's raising up uh, leaders uh, having a network, uh, whether it's pouring into people, whether it is uh, doing various things through media. There's so many different areas that he has shown himself able and capable in apostolic ministry as the times allotted him and as the challenges came. And so that's just a brief enumeration of the ministry of apostle. There's so many great works I could recommend that get into that in more detail, but uh, I'm so thrilled to be able to contribute in a small manner in this incredible historic gathering. God bless you. <laughs>